Hello, Lifeway Church family, and welcome to our weekend service. At this time, you may be feeling very overwhelmed and thinking, what in the world, how can I, as a son and daughter of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord and Savior, how can I make a difference? Or you may be thinking, I, there's no way I'm even thinking that. I'm so concerned and worried about what's going on. I feel powerless. I feel hopeless. I want to share with you that some amazing news today in Scripture, and that is talking about the power of humility. Now, we have been in the book of Philippians for the last month, and I also want to share with you to please join us at Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock for our Bible study in Philippians. And it's been a great time and diving into God's words. And the thing that I have heard most from those who participate is that they are feeling encouraged, they are feeling empowered, and they're, we're just learning and learning together, living life together, discovering more of what Jesus Christ has for us. That's the way to do it, especially in these troubling times. And so this weekend, I want to share with you, still kind of focusing on the book of Philippians, but one main theme, and that is the power of humility. And so I would like to read, begin uh, this weekend service and sharing with you um, the sermon is in Philippians chapter 2, and in Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5, it states this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory God the Father. If you are feeling overwhelmed, hopeless, and despair, I want to share with you that as my brother and sister in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit within us. We have God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit residing in us, and we have to stop, catch our breath, and reflect and say, Father, here I am, help me. Help me and use me. In the midst of all these things that we are facing, I wanna share with you that the power of humility may seem crazy, may seem, being humble, that's gonna help. You know, having the attitude of humility, well, let's understand what humility actually means. Well, biblically, what humility means, and we look in a definition to find, is, is this, is an attitude of dependence. An attitude of dependence as we recognize that all we have is a gift from God. An attitude of dependence as we recognize that all we have is a gift from God. Now, there's three things I want to share with you in my study for this sermon that Charles Stanley brings out, the pastor of First Baptist Church of Atlanta, the speaking pastor there. And he shares these three things I simply want to share and help us defining about humility. The first thing is this, is that humility is quick to confess sin and slow to point out sin in others. Humility is quick to confess sin and quick and slow, excuse me, to point out the sin in others. We're real easy to base our spirituality and our lives on measuring up to other people. And what we need to do is measure up to God. The greatest measuring stick is the life of Jesus Christ. And that's where we have the attitude to look at that and look from him. If you're looking for guidance, look to Jesus and look at his attitude and the things that he did and live out, and, and live out his, his actions and what he's done for people. The second thing, humility asks for and receives God's forgiveness and in turn is quick to forgive others. There is power in forgiveness. And over the last several weeks, we looked at Philippians or talked, we brought up Philippians, Philippians and forgiveness and the Apostle Paul. It's kind of hard for us to go and say, hey, people have really hurt me or done some things or people in the past. And you know, I want to share with you, forgiveness is not for the person who offended us. Forgiveness is to free us. It's to free us from bitterness. It's to free us from reliving those hurtful things over and over. 
It's saying, Father, you've forgiven me. I forgive this person, and I want to move forward in you. And that doesn't um, allow the person who offended us over there to, to continue to have power over us. And so those hurt feelings, that anger, and different things that resides in you, the frustration right now of situations and what other things are going on, I want to share with you the power of humility leads us to the power of forgiveness, helps us to realize that God forgave me and I can forgive others and then move forward. And I've shared earlier in the last several weeks that sometimes going to that person and asking forgiveness, it may make things worse. And so we can go to God and we can say, Father, help me to do this. Help me to forgive this person and in my spirit to move forward. And so already we've seen that we are to quickly to ask forgiveness and to not look at the sins of others. We are to be quick to forgive because God's forgiven us. And thirdly, I want to share with you, humility is content to be behind the scene. My glory needs to be God's. It's not about Russ Peters. It is about Jesus Christ and the things that he's done for us. So when we look at this and we look at the characteristic, especially in Philippians chapter 2, where Jesus, as it's, once again it says, <clears throat> but made himself nothing. The God of heaven made himself nothing and became that of a servant. What some translation says to have the attitude of a slave. That means we call God Lord and we serve him and we seek him and everything is to focus on him. Jesus Christ did that. He became a servant. He became lowly for you and I. So much so that he was obedient to death on the cross. And so this power of humbleness and humility, I want to share with you this morning, or whenever you're watching the video, is sharing with you this weekend, is I want to use the example of three people. The first person we discover is found in 2 Kings. And in 2 Kings... We see that there is a lot of trouble and different things going on in the lives of the Israelites, that uh, their leadership is bad. They are following other gods, and God brought up another nation to, to punish them for serving foreign gods, gods that were not real and evil. And what we come up is we come back in verse, in chapter 5, excuse me, verse 1, and it talks about a man named Naaman. And in verse 1 of chapter 5 of 2 Kings, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. That was a death sentence. That was an outcast. So God raised this person up, this valiant lord, uh, warrior and enemy of the people of Israel, to, to go in and punish Israel and bring in because of their disobedience to God. And what was happening is that Nahum and his soldiers would go in and they would do raids against Israel. And one of these raids, they captured a young Israeli girl and she was Nahum's servant. And we find out about her in verse 2 of <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 5. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. Now listen to this. So already I told you that the Israelites were being punished, that they were serving other gods, and God used <coughs> Naaman and his army to come and punish them. And one of their raids, the scripture says, they took this young girl. Can you imagine being whisked away from your family? and forced to serve in this household of your enemy. And I want you to listen to this attitude and listen to this humbleness that the servant girl did for Naaman, her enemy. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. Now, the rest of the story is pretty amazing. And just sharing with you is that Naaman takes this young girl's advice. Uh, he goes to Israel. And here's something amazing. The enemy, the king of the enemy country, 
and the, the greatest warrior of that enemy country. They listened to God more than God's people. And so during this time, the people of Israel were not following God as well as, as they should have. But here their enemy decided, hey, okay, I've got nothing to lose, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and do this. And so he goes and meets with the prophet Elisha. And he meets with the prophet Elisha, and Elisha tells him to go down to the Jordan River. Now I know it sounds really romantic and, and everything else about being baptized in the Jordan, but for the most part, uh, the Jordan River was the Israelite sewer system. And so uh, Naaman wasn't very happy about being told to do this. And his soldiers had to convince him to go and down to the, and, and to follow Elisha's commands. And so he did it. And by following God's commands, he became clean. He went back and he was a believer. He said to Elisha, he said, I ask you this, is that please forgive me and God forgive me that there's times I have to hold the king up when he goes into these foreign gods and when he kneels, I have to kneel with him. And he, he's bringing all this stuff out. Here's this enemy of Israel that, that he feels bad about having to bow with the king to this foreign god. And it was during that time, the Israelites, they didn't care. And that's why they're being punished. But in all of this, I want you to hear this, is how God loved his people and cared for them, is that the attitude of the slave girl. You know, her name is not even mentioned. It says here, and I'll share with you in one of my devotionals, it says, the little girl's faith and Naaman's quest contrast with the stubbornness of Israel's king. A leader in a, in a might, in mighty Aram sought the, sought the God of Israel's own king when the leaders of Israel would not. We don't know the little girl's name or much about her, but her brief word to help her mistress brought healing and faith in God to a powerful Armenian captor. God had placed her for a purpose, and she was faithful. So what do we learn from this young girl who was torn away from her family and the attitude that she has? Well, here's the question in my devotional that I want to share with you. Where has God put you? In what situation does God have you to share his love with others? And also, no matter how humble or small your position, God can use you to spread his word. And we're to look for opportunities to tell others what God can do. There's no telling who will hear your message. If you're feeling overwhelmed and thinking, man, I don't know what I can do, you are a child of the king. And praying and asking God and seeking him, say, Father, show me what you would have me to do. Even in the midst of situations, he will. He loves you and he cares about you. And we never want to lose the fact that there is a plan and purpose that God has for us and to seek him daily. And as we seek him, the overwhelmingness, the fear comes de calms down. And yet we are not going to do that if we don't live in the power of humility, if we don't live in the same attitude of Jesus Christ. Another <clears throat> individual I want to share with you is one of my favorite characters. And sometimes people say pastors have a theme and they you know, always go back and talk about this or that. It's always the same thing. Well, if anything, uh, my theme is uh, the character of Jonathan, the Prince of Israel. And I love his attitude and the things. I just want to share some things about Jonathan. Uh, you, you find out about him after David kills Goliath in uh, 1 Samuel. And he was Saul, the first king of Israel's son. And Saul disobeyed God. And scripture says that because of his disobedience, the Spirit of God withdrew from Saul. And Saul, he could have made some choices. He could have repented, but he never did. And so what happened is God took the kingdom away from him. And God called the prophet Samuel to go and anoint David and to bless him to be the next king. Well, after David killed Goliath, Saul's son Jonathan and David became friends. They were loyal. Their friendship was something that they didn't let anything. They, they trusted God. They didn't trust each other and depend upon each other. They trusted God in their friendship. They were loyal and they protected each other. And so Jonathan... He was the next in line to be the king of Israel. But instead of that, he trusted God. He trusted him. In chapter 20, what we see is that when he finds out that his father is pretty much determined to kill David, he meets David out in the woods and they make a pledge together. And so at this, it says in 
verse 41 of chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, talking to uh, a young boy that was carrying his arrows and, and David was hiding out in the field, waiting to hear from Jonathan about what Saul was going to do. Jonathan, uh, excuse me, uh, basically, I'm trying to think of the term, <laughs> he shot, that's it, he shot uh, some bows and arrows, he shot the arrows out of the bow, excuse me, and sent them further and sent the boy to catch him. That was a signal to David, sharing with David that, um, hey, my dad wants to kill you, we need to talk and let's move further. So this, this passionate um, conversation had just shows the relationship and love they have for each other. And so verse 41 of 1 Samuel chapter 20, after the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. Some of the things I want us to know about Jonathan's character is this, is that loyalty was one of his most greatest qualities. It is um, the most selfless part of love. To be loyal, to live only, to be loyal, you cannot only live for yourself. And so loyal people not only stand by their commitments, they are willing to suffer for them. Jonathan is a shining example of loyalty. Sometimes, he was forced to deal with conflicting loyalties to his father, Saul, and to his friend, David. His solution to that conflict teaches us both how to be loyal and what must guide loyalty in Jonathan. It was truth and God's love. Jonathan realized that the source of truth was God. And it was God that demanded ultimate loyalty. If you look at the life of one of my favorite Bible characters who really points to Jesus Christ, Jonathan not only protected David from his father Saul, but he would eventually sacrifice his life protecting the people of Israel. Jonathan could have turned David in. Jonathan could have portrayed David because, hey, I'm going to be the next king, but he didn't because loyalty to God was his highest priority. When we look at this, when we look at the things um, of what God has done, for us in our lives, and we look at the life of Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done for us, my prayer is that you and I can see, wow, Father, um, you know, it's not difficult for me to share my love for you. It's not difficult for me because of what you've done. These two people, the slave girl that we saw in 2 Kings and Jonathan, God used them. And we see them. Here we are thousands of years later after these people are, are, are with God in heaven. Here we are. We're talking about them because of their testimony. Another powerful one I want to share with you as, <clears throat> as we look at the power of humility is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. And on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. I want to share with you that the God who spoke and created the universe, limiting himself, lim excuse me, limiting himself in the form of a human being of Jesus Christ and walking this earth, the same spoken word at any time could have destroyed us all. But because of his love for us, because he cares for us. I've had the privilege of pretty much growing up in the church most of my life and very familiar with the passage of John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We go on further in John 3.17. For God did not send a son into the world to condemn the world. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn us. He sent Jesus so that we might be saved. And that's a choice that we have, is to trust him. There's a lot of concerns and there's frustrations. 
But I want to share with you the example of these three that we talked about today. The slave girl, Jonathan, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's the power of humility. And more than ever before, we need that. We need that, the power of humility, to be humble before God. Don't we say, well, I'm not going to humble myself before anybody. They may take advantage of me, or they may be doing stuff, or look around, you know. We can talk about all the different types of things and mistrust and different things going around. But here's someone we can depend upon. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And when we seek Him, if you're thinking, what can I do now? Well, too often, you know what I've done in my life? Too many times, what I've done is I've seen a problem, and I've said, dun da, da I'm going to go fix it. And I've made it worse. But I praise God, and I pray that as I go on into eternity when God calls me, that I share this with you, that I can look back and say, I did this more <laughs> than rushing ahead and trying to fix it is that I sought humbly my God and His answers. And I tell you, when I have sat quietly before God and asked for His help and for Him to show me, He has made some amazing things happen. Amazing things. And that's the power of humility. The power of humbleness is instead of going about our days, too often we begin our days without God. Too often we go into conflicts and crisis and everything else without God. Pray first. Seek Him first. Because He loves us. He's our Creator. And we look at the example. We look at the example that He was obedient to death. Death on the cross. A horrible, cruel death. And so as we close, I want to share with you that humbleness, humility, Humility is simply living in the truth, recognizing the reality and character of God and living in personal dependence on God as creator and savior. What I want to share with you is that whenever before our world needs to see the church and the difference it makes, the church of Jesus Christ, and that difference in him alone, in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote of his thorn in the flesh, apparently with some form of adversity. <clears throat> the adversity drove him to his knees and caused him to do serious self-examination. After begging the Lord three times, the Apostle Paul, please God, remove this, remove this. God revealed to him the reason for the thorn. Paul described it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messer of Satan to buffet me, lest I exalted above measure. The thorn in the flesh was God's way of doing some preventive maintenance. It was his way of assuring that Paul's popularity and special spiritual privilege would not cause him to think more highly of himself than he ought. What I want to share with you is we're living in times of adversity and times of concern. And it would be really something that we could find a shortcut. My question today is not knowing how long or what's going on. And yes, as I'm talking to you, our state, our county's going into stage two. But my prayer is that we realize and learn from these times that we have a father we can trust, that he cares for us. In these times of adversity, is God allows them. He, sometimes, he doesn't cause them sometimes. Sometimes we've we got to take responsibility for ourselves that some adversity happens because of mistakes that we've made, um, <clears throat> of, of going ahead instead of seeking Him, or also just sinning without regard to the consequences. But that in the midst of these adversities, these things that are going on, is that you and I can realize that God is faithful and true, and He loves us. And there's no better place to be than to place our trust and our love in Him and Him alone. What that slave girl and Jonathan, they didn't realize, is their character was pointing to Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, as he talks about the thorn in his flesh, and sharing with you, is that it was there. He even realized, hey, this happened so that 
I would stay humbly before God and seek him. Paul knew his attitude. Paul knew his behaviors. And God placed within Paul something just to keep focused on God. My prayer is that you and I, instead of looking at everything out saying, man, I need to do something or just anything. Well, it's not about us. It's about the glory of God and what he has called us to do. And he's called us to seek him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we do that, we come in place. We come in line. We come in relationship with God who gives us wisdom and makes things better than we can ever imagine. As I close this morning, I want to say this, share this with you, is that a humble person can count on productivity and peace. They entrust the results of the labors to God and credits God for success. That person, his life is very bright. Oswald Chambers says this, to say, thank God, I know I am saved and sanctified is in the sight of God of humility, the attitude of humility. It means you have so completely abandoned yourself to God that you know he is true. I want to read that again. To say, thank God, I know I am saved and sanctified is in the sight of God, the most powerful thing of humility. It means you have so completely abandoned yourself to God that you know he is true. That word abandon may seem important. What's that? What are we talking about here? It means everything that I have, taking my next breath, belongs to God. But what about all the circumstances around us? What about all this? Stop. Say, Father, here I am. Here I am. What would you have me to do? You know, when we do that, you know what happens? We're able to see the interests, the things going on in our neighbor's lives. When that happens, the power of humility allows us to see God showing us the concerns in our own family, in people around us, how we begin to view people, not like, well, this person, man, they're annoying or something about them. I don't know. It stops. Says, what would you have me to do in this situation, Lord? Instead of get me out of here, God, God's saying, I love you and I have you here for a purpose. And it's to serve those around you. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to I'm not going to care about other people or their concerns or what things I can do for them if I don't seek God first. I close this morning with this quote from A.W. Tozer. The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion and as strong as Samson. But he has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is weak and helpless as God declared him to be. But paradoxically, he knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. That is his motto. Once again, in himself, nothing. In God, everything. That is my prayer for each of us. That is my prayer that we realize that in God is everything and in myself is nothing. And that in that is who we are in Jesus Christ. Is that as we seek him and as we humble ourselves before him, realize that what motivates us is his love for us and we are more valuable than the angels. I love you all very much. And during these times, we desire prayer. Please call me. If you desire some some time just to talk, I'd love to get together with you. And we'll, of course, do safe distancing if you are comfortable with that or whatever you need. But most important is my prayer that you and I begin, that you and I begin to live in the call and the power of humility and to seek our Heavenly Father and to share his love with others. It's the power of humility that makes a difference because that's the power that comes from Jesus Christ and living the example he set for us. God bless you. I love you. And have a great weekend.
May the peace of God be in your heart and life and comfort you at this time. God bless you all. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters, and thank you for those who have joined us. Lord, we praise you, we love you, and we just give you all the honor and glory. And help us to be a people that seek you first and share your love with others. We can't do that, Father. We can't do that focused on everything in the world, and the circumstances. And, Father, forgive us when we start to disregard things like, well, man, all I can do is pray. Well, amen. <laughs> yeah. Um, prayer is powerful. We need to do that. Help us to seek you first. And, and, Father, when we do that, we are assured of your power and your wisdom and guidance in sharing your love with others. More than ever before, Father, our world needs you, Lord Jesus. Help us to share that love and to see others come to know you. We praise you and love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you all, and thank you for being with me this weekend. We'll see you again.